Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a warm welcome as we um, bring to the, to the podium someone who has dedicated his life to world security and peace, Ambassador Richard Butler. General McGee, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And thank you to General Lord for presiding over all things here tonight and having me here at the base. I want to also recognize Colonel Allen Beck because while my guys and I were flying over the airspace of Iraq, uh, he and his guys were looking after us and I deeply appreciate that. I also want to express appreciation to Dr. Schneider for what he does in leading the Center on Counterproliferation here uh, at the Air Force Academy. I'm really glad that you mentioned rugby, General McGee, because if any of you have ever seen that game, you would know, uh, and my five broken noses prove it. I explained to General McGee that all that means is that it doesn't smell too good anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyone who's seen rugby played at a serious level, as indeed I did, would know that it was absolutely perfect preparation for negotiating with the Iraqis in Baghdad. <laughs> What I'm going to do on the subject that uh, I've come to talk with you about, which is dealing with rogue states, uh, and in particular the case of Iraq, is to begin by telling you a little bit of the verity, a little bit of uh, what it was like to deal with the Iraqis in Baghdad in order to um, uh, do what should be done at any good dinner, and I thank you again, General Lord, for this splendid dinner, uh, which is to lighten the proceedings a little bit with a couple of true stories from real life, but also with the point that the story that I will tell you, I think, does lead towards some of the very important issues that we continue to face today in the business of trying to restrain the spread of weapons of mass destruction. And after I've told you my story and made a couple of serious points, I will throw myself as uh, I think both George Bush and Al Gore are now doing upon the court of your opinion <laughs> <laughs> by begging you to ask me at least one or two questions and I'll be course, of course be very happy to try and answer them as best I can. Okay, my story. In 1998, that is about seven years after Iraq was expelled from Kuwait and had been put under the strongest disarmament and arms control monitoring regime that had been created in the modern period, and I date that in the period since the end of the Second World War. It became clear to me as head of UNSCOM that our time was running out. We had been on the job for seven years. We had achieved a, a pretty good account of Iraq's work in all of the four fields of weaponry that were at issue missile, nuclear, chemical and biological. And in some cases, in some of the fields of weaponry, we'd actually done what the law passed by the Security Council required us to do, and the words in that law were destroy, remove or render harmless those specified weapons. We'd actually done quite a bit of that, but not completed the job. But early in 1998, it became clear to me that our time to get that job done properly was running out. It was running out for two main reasons. One was that the consensus in the Security Council 
to oblige Iraq to obey the law was starting to crumble. In particular, at the end of 1997, maybe I should turn this down slightly, yeah? at the end of 90, can you hear me at the back? Sorry, you can't. I'll, I'll start all over again, right? <laughs> <laughs> Is that, sorry, I mean it seriously, are you not able to hear? All right, well, this is, this is giving feedback, but I'll try and talk up a bit. The first sign of this crumbling of resolve within the Security Council to hold Iraq to the law was at the end of 1997, when I had presented a report to the Security Council on Iraq's current behavior. I had to give six monthly reports and I gave the six monthly report in October 1997 in which I pointed out that Iraq had been refusing to give us access to certain materials we needed and had tried to bring down some of our helicopters. And instead of the Security Council doing what would be normal and appropriate under those circumstances, which is condemn this behavior demand that Iraq cooperate with us, maybe say a word about continuation of sanctions, use whatever means at their disposal to make clear to Iraq that this arms control organization continued to have their strong support and that Iraq could see no way out, certainly no way out of sanctions until it, unless it cooperated with us. The council didn't do that. There was a divided vote on a resolution to that effect, you know, warning Iraq that it must continue to cooperate. And in particular, Russia split from other members of permanent members of the council by abstaining on the resolution and was then that dragged in with it France and China. So you had a split within the Security Council with three permanent members beginning to walk away from holding Iraq's feet to the fire and two Western permanent members, I don't know where that place is, France, but the U <laughs> well, you, maybe you can ask me a question about that. <laughs> the US and the UK, of course, insisting on, on Saddam being held to account. But that, that was the first sign that I saw, but early in 1998 there were further signs that the political resolve to make Iraq comply was crumbling. The second thing was that a growing campaign, which I will quite plainly call propaganda, with respect to the impact of sanctions on ordinary Iraqis, was starting to bite in the West, in the liberal, tolerant democracies that are the societies of the West, with their free media, the campaign that said the sanctions had gone on too long, too many innocent Iraqi citizens were being harmed by them, too many children were dying through lack of food, quite specifically, numbers of infant deaths were quoted and indeed at that time when I went to Baghdad in early 1998 again in May and June July and so on one of the shows to which I would be treated outside the place where I slept I hesitate to call it a hotel but the place where I slept was that the Iraqis would parade infantile coffins uh, we never knew whether there was anything in them but they would parade infantile coffins along the road outside our place of residence and chant slogans saying, this is what you're doing. When I got off my plane, which Colonel Allenbeck had helped protect on one occasion at uh, Havania Airport, an Iraqi journalist asked me, Ambassador Butler, Mr. Chairman, Chairman of Anscom, you know, Mr. Chairman, how many Iraqi children have you killed this month? Now, what I'm trying to illustrate to you was that there was a major campaign underway to say that sanctions had gone on too long and that this was taking hold in the West, in, amongst publics, in the media and in the Security Council. 
and in, I call it propaganda because at no stage was any reference made to the single central salient fact here which was that sanctions could have been relieved at any moment determined by Saddam giving us his weapons because what the law said is the moment that Iraq has taken all the actions required of it with respect to arms control that the sanctions would go and all I all I what I needed to respond to this was to be in a position to tell the Security Council that we had identified and destroyed removed or rendered harmless Iraq's prohibited weapons and that with automaticity no sanctions decision was required it was automatic in the law that the sanctions would go and the fact is that this propaganda may, never made any reference to that that Saddam had always had in his hands the key to the release of 22 million ordinary Iraqis from the impact of sanctions and that key was called disarmament and that he was resolutely refusing to turn that key but that fact aside I knew that the sanctions propaganda was having its effect and putting these two things together that the political resolve to get this job done finish the job was waning and that people especially in the democracies were becoming anxious that we should bring sanctions on ordinary Iraqis to an end I knew that we were running out of time so in the in the middle of 1998 I sat down with our scientific staff and I said to them I want from you the absolute final list of the necessary conditions for the disarmament of Iraq on that list must be everything that we know that they retain in the missile chemical biological field that if we were to overlook in any way would mean that the job was not done properly and that there would be danger I don't want I said no one is to perjure themselves but I want to clear the decks of any any uh, lesser materials tell me what they are and I'll decide whether they should be on this list or not I want a list of the necessary conditions for the disarm the final disarmament of Iraq and my people drew up that list may I say those people included some remarkable individuals sent to us by the armed forces of the United States including the Air Force the list that was drawn up was gone over analyzed turned upside down back the front and, and it arrived at a form where I was prepared to take it to the Security Council and make very clear to them that this as it were if I were to be an honest man which I insisted I was and, and am was my bottom line to do what the Russians were pressuring me to do I, was, I went to Moscow at their request and Primakov who was then foreign Evgeny Primakov who was then foreign minister of Russia hectored me across the table in the foreign ministry in Moscow saying your standards are too high lower the bar be more flexible let Iraq out you know I was under intense pressure of this kind but I became satisfied that the list that we drew up was accurate and I became satisfied that the things that may have been on such a list six months earlier but which I decided to push to one side were not within the frame of the necessary conditions they were lesser items which if we got Iraq properly disarmed could then be taken care of under an un ongoing system of monitoring which would which we had established and would it was expected would then continue to operate so I took my list to the Security Council and I made crystal clear to them 
and I don't mean this to sound unduly semantic, but I made crystal clear to them. I call these the necessary conditions for the disarmament of Iraq. And I said, bear in mind whether or not they will become the sufficient conditions, and this wasn't, as I said, just semantic playing with words, whether or not these necessary conditions would become the sufficient conditions for the disarmament of Iraq would depend entirely on Iraq, on whether it gave me the things that were on that list, whether it answered all the questions, provided all the materials. It would depend absolutely on the quality of their response. But I did imply that if that response was good and clear, and we could destroy, remove or render harmless what was then revealed, that I might well be in a position to come to the Council and say it's over as far as removing existing weapons is concerned and that you could lift sanctions if you choose to, provided there's an ongoing system of monitoring and verification of Iraq's WMD capability to try to see that it doesn't make these weapons again in the future. The Council was divided about this. The, you know, predictably, the Russians, the French, the Chinese tried to knock down my list. The Chinese in particular were very unhappy with my approach and in the end I had a real shootout across the table with the Chinese ambassador and he grudgingly allowed me to go to Baghdad with this list. And so without the direct blessing of the Security Council, but without being prohibited from doing so. I took this list to Baghdad. Now, that was in June of 1998. And I gave the list to Tariq Aziz, the Deputy Prime Minister of Iraq, the person Saddam Hussein had put in charge of dealing with us in our work. And he quarrelled with me about some of the items on the list, but basically, in the end, accepted it. And he said, we want this done quickly. I said, so do I. I can do it, I think, in six or eight weeks, provided you cooperate. He said, good. We will come back at the beginning of August and we'll bring this to conclusion. Indeed, he postured to the extent of saying to me, we should go outside the room now and announce this to the world's media, which we did. I quarrelled with him and said that I didn't see any need for that. If he wanted to talk to the media, go ahead. I said, in a perhaps saccharine way, after all, you're so good at it. <laughs> and he said, he said, no, I want you to come too. It's his way of trying to pin me down in public, I suppose. But I did go and stand in front of 40 television cameras and announce to the world that this is what we had agreed to do. Um, it wasn't one of my rugby appearances on television, but it was, I said it was about as rough, you know. But I did say in public, and he had to stand by me and listen to us, I did say in public that he has made this promise to me that we can do this in six weeks and that only if it is done properly will it be the end. And I put that all on the record for the people who, of course, really run our world, you know, like CNN and so on. You know. And I went straight back to New York and instruct, called our teams together and I put into the field the most intensive period of work that we'd seen for a long time in every field, nuclear, chemical, biological, the lot. Every inspector I could get, every scientist I had, we deployed about 75 people straight away into the field to do, to chase down the things on that list. And now I'll tell you what they were. We needed an account of their indigenous production of missile engines about which they'd been lying to us. I needed 300 tonnes of Scud-specific fuel 
which Tariq Aziz had tried to tell me was just petrol. It could run any old engine. And I said, no, 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 no. It's got an oxidizer in it that will only run in a Scud engine. And he said, well, you, well, why do you want it? You know we don't have any more Scuds, so you don't need this fuel. And I said, no, nice try, wrong logic. I said, as long as that fuel exists, it means you've either lied to us about not having any Scuds or you expect to get some Scuds in the near future. Because that's the only damn thing, excuse me, that's the only jolly thing <laughs> <laughs> that fuel is good for. And in the chemical area, we need, needed some chemical munitions that they had said the fill in which would have polymerized and would have hardened and be no good. We opened four of these shells and found that they had good, strong, liquid mustard in them that was 97% pure. And we wanted some R400 aerial bombs that had been filled with chemical substances. And we wanted an account of their production of VX, which they had never given us, even though we had demonstrated that they had made 4,000 litres of it, four tonnes of it, and had put it in Scud warheads, which they had sworn for years on a stack of Korans that they had, <laughs> that they had never done. And finally, I made him a very particular offer, which is highly relevant in the field that I think is of gravest concern today, and Dr. Snyder is, is, is well aware of this and I know is, is working in the centre on this, biological weapons. In the biological area where Iraq had comprehensively lied to us for four years saying it had no biological weapons program at all. And when we were able to demonstrate that that was simply nonsense, they switched and said, well, we only had a small one and it was only defensive. Before I leave here tonight, if someone can tell me convincingly what a defensive biological weapons program is, I'll be, I'll be eternally in your debt. You know? <laughs> they had always misled us about biology and it was a real sticking point. And this is highly relevant to the points that I'll conclude from this story. I made, at the last moment in this six week period, I made a very, very high risk but particular offer to Tariq Aziz. I said, you've messed us around for seven years now on biology while we chased growth media, manufacturing capability, scientific know-how, indeed personnel. How many competent biologists did you have in the program and so on? And you have comprehensively misled us on all of, the, all of these things. You've no idea the extent to which this happened countless tons of growth media that they imported were simply corrected by hand in a document saying, oh, sorry, we put two zeros too many in there, so 5,000 became 50. There was a clerical error, you know, stuff like this. Or persons who we knew were working on biology simply disappearing. Finding little instrument little vials in a laboratory that had smallpox written on them and they said oops we didn't mean smallpox we meant you know something else uh, we found a laboratory rat in a drawer once in the laboratory which pointed to work that had been going on there I mean I'm not making this stuff up it's hilarious but we found a dead rat in a drawer which made us smell a rat <laughs> <laughs> with respect to their the lies they'd been telling us about biology and all sorts of clues like that but much harder information as well made us quite certain that the, the biggest deception was taking place in the area of biology. So I made, I, I took a chance and I made the special offer to Tariq Aziz in this six week period. I said forget about all that other stuff, okay? We're required to look for all that other stuff under the law but let's go to the chase. You give me your weapons. You give me every biological weapon you have, because that's the sharp end of the stick. That's what we really need. And you back it up with the documentation that shows me that this is all there is. The production orders, the fill orders, the place of manufacture. And I might be able to tell the Security Council that I've got all the weapons that they made in the biology field, and as for the rest, their capability, we'll put that under monitoring. 
I said, let's take this top-down approach where previously we'd always worked from the floor upwards. See if we can be creative about this and solve the problem. And he said, fine, what an, what an interesting idea. And so, to get to the end of this story, I did go back there as he suggested, sorry, in six weeks' time, but I have to say something before that. I lost my thread. I put into the field intensive investigation of all the things I've just mentioned to you. And within weeks, within two weeks, my chief inspectors were coming back saying, they're not doing it. They're still telling us lies. They're still preventing us from looking at the buildings and talking to the people that we need to see. They've not produced anything new on the missile engines. They're still saying they don't know where the scud fuel is, etc., etc. It was clear to me in a couple of weeks that once again they were obfuscating, to put it at the least, or outright lying, to put it more directly, and they were concealing weapons capability that we knew to exist and that they didn't want us to get hold of. So when I went back there in August 1998, we had our final conversation on the 3rd of August. In the foreign ministry, this darkened room with the, all these Iraqi generals on one side of the, with all respect to generals, so, I mean, you know, the, the very nasty uniforms. Have you seen it? Very nasty. But all these Iraqi generals responsible for the weapons programs on the other side of the table, and I with a bunch, a small collection of our experts on our side of the table. And Aziz said to me in the morning session, he said, you start. You start. You're a guest here. You're the guest here. You start. You tell us what the state of affairs is. And so I laid it out in each weapons area, making clear that our list was nowhere near fulfilled, that they had not cooperated, and that this was a bitter disappointment to me. At the end of that, Aziz, in a completely scornful way, just said, well, I, you know, I, I assumed that you would say that. And I, th I remember thinking to myself, well, you didn't have to be Sherlock Holmes to work that out, because, <laughs> I mean, but you, know, you know that you gave us nothing. But he was so scornful, dismissive. I knew that you would say that. Typical unscom, you know, hostility to us. He said, this meeting is ended. Come back here tonight at 8 o'clock when I will give you the answer of the leadership of the government of Iraq. And we all know who that is. So I duly went back there at 8 o'clock that night. And he said, what happened was quite simple. He said, these are the circumstances. This is the decision of the leadership of the government of Iraq. He said, Iraq is disarmed. There is nothing more. You will therefore be given nothing more and you will not be permitted to conduct any further disarmament inspections in Iraq. He said, these are the facts and it is your duty to return to New York and tell the Security Council that Iraq is disarmed and demand the lifting of sanctions. And if you don't do this, he said, it will be on your conscience. And I said straight back across the table, I said, I will not do what you ask me to do because I cannot do it. I cannot do it because you have refused to give me the evidence and materials I need to be able to do it. And I said quietly, thank you for your kind concern about my conscience, but I assure you I'll sleep easily in my bed tonight. And he said, well, it's over. I said, that's right, it's over. And I went back to New York the next day and reported accordingly to the Security Council and there was some toing and froing for a few weeks, but resulting in the end in another promise by Iraq to resume cooperation, which they broke within a month 
which I then reported to the Security Council and the United States and the United Kingdom then conducted Operation Desert Fox. And that is the end of my story. That is what happened in the closing phase of the attempt to disarm Iraq and establish an indefinite, uh, for an indefinite duration a system of monitoring of Saddam's addiction to weapons of mass destruction. Now, what, what, was the, what, are the, what are the lessons there? What are the things at issue there that are intrinsic to the Iraq case but are of wider interest in our attempts to restrain the spread of weapons of mass destruction? There are probably a dozen points, but I'll try and keep them simpler than that. First of all, there exists, and it is the case for almost 40 years now, a set of norms with respect to the ownership, use, deployment or transfer of weapons of mass destruction that apply in the nuclear, chemical and biological fields. These norms are widely respected by the great bulk of the community of nations. In some cases they have been implemented with great success. I'm thinking in particular of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is by no means without problems, but has helped produce a world very different from the one that we looked at in 1962, when John F. Kennedy as President of the United States observed rightly that we were staring at the possibility of 20 to 30 nuclear weapon states. There are other parts of this tapestry of treaties that work less well. The Biological Weapons Convention doesn't have a means of verification. The Chemical Weapons Convention, the modern form of it, is still in its relatively early days. But I will make this first point to you. One of the truly important creations of the world that we have built since the defeat of Hitler that is the world of the United Nations period in which the concept that through law we could create a better and more civilized world has been the application of that thinking, thinking born in this great country, in San Francisco, in the conference on the Charter of the UN at the, and, at the con and at the trial in Nuremberg that established the principle of individual responsibility for actions and crimes against humanity. That world that started in 1945 made it possible for us to develop these norms with respect to weapons of mass destruction. And they're now 40 years old and they're substantially honoured. Faulty though some aspects of the treaties involved may be. Those are precisely the norms that have been challenged root and branch by Saddam Hussein. He has cheated on those norms to an extent and in a manner quite unlike any other person. He sought to make a nuclear explosive device while a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. That's every treaty's worst nightmare, that someone will cheat from within a treaty regime. He has made and used chemical weapons, the first person to do so, to use chemical weapons for political or genocidal purposes since Adolf Hitler. That's another one of his peculiar distinctions. He has contrary to his undertakings under the Biological Weapons Convention, sought to make a whole array of bio biological weapons. So my first point is that in dealing with the case of Iraq, we are dealing with the most systematic and 
serious challenge to a set of norms that we have developed over almost half a century that are of actually extreme importance to the security of all of us. Secondly, in doing this, he has lodged the most serious challenge that we have ever seen since it was created 50 years ago to the authority of the Security Council of the United Nations. Now that authority has not always been used in a way, in ways that have seemed sound or appropriate. But that body, again created at San Francisco, is unique in its ability to make international law in the field of the maintenance of peace and security, that is its mandate, in its composition involving five permanent members with a veto plus 10 others, and in what it is charged specifically with doing in keeping whole the non-proliferation regimes. It specifically is given by those treaties the responsibility of dealing with infractions of them. And the most systematic challenge, the most thoroughgoing challenge that has been made to the role and authority of that council of that instrument is that that has been entered by Saddam Hussein with respect to his manufacture and use of weapons of mass destruction. The next point I would make is this, that in the face of this, and this is where it gets really tough, in the face of this, this challenge to their authority, the challenge to the tapestry of treaties that is so important to all of us. The Security Council has broken up, has failed us, has walked away, and that is the state of affairs that exists today. That state of affairs is that Saddam has been without inspection for two years. I can assure you he is back in business he has recalled his nuclear design team. He has sought clandestinely to obtain parts overseas for his missile program to make them fly longer. He has rebuilt his chemical and biological manufacturing establishments. He is back in business. The sanctions about which such successful propaganda was waged are crumbling daily and he has built a massive and successful black market in oil that means that his regime is awash with money. And by the way, to go back to the infantile coffins and the propagandist aspect of sanctions, I'll tell you two things. Virtually none of that money has gone to ordinary Iraqis and there is today in their food for oil account in New York, the account on which they can draw to buy food and medicines for ordinary Iraqis, five billion dollars on which they can draw at any time if they submit proposals for the purchase of food or medicine and they are simply not doing it. And those are the real circumstances and perhaps I should add that when the troubles broke out three to four weeks ago in Israel between the Israelis and the Palestinians, Guess who stepped up four or five days later? Saddam. Are you aware of what he said? Saddam stepped forward and said, if any Arab country will give me a toehold of land near Israel, I will deal with the Zionist problem, he said. And he went on to say the only reason why the Israelis are able to behave like this is because, and I quote, Arab swords have been allowed to rust in their sheaths. This is a man who prefers war to peace. This is a man who postures to lead the Arab world against what it considers to be, what he considers to be their enemy, starting with Israel. This is a man who would happily throw petrol on the fire that is the Middle East. Now, <clears throat> In the face of this, the Security Council has started to break up, let sanctions go, 
failed to enforce its own law and has massively in that sense contributed to the challenge to its authority that Saddam has lodged. That is why the book that I've written has as its subtitle The Crisis of Global Security. You tell me when I stop in a moment, what else, what other word should I have used? Isn't this a crisis? A major objective of civilized humanity for half a century has been to stop the spread of weapons of mass destruction. The major challenge to that action that we've seen in that period has been by Saddam Hussein. The major instrument through which we are to deal with that is the Security Council. First, by non-military means called sanctions, they're in the dust now, and by military means, by enforcement if necessary. And I ask you, what possibility could you foresee of there being enforcement action against Saddam under all the present circumstances whether you refer to that when one refers to those in the Middle East or in the political relations between us and the Russians within the Security Council or indeed domestic public opinion in this country the possibility of us taking military action it seems to me is remote at best Those are the key issues that arise out of the story that I told you. And I'm deeply conscious of the fact that you're all sitting there looking as if you're at a funeral. <laughs> so I don't honestly know how to light, lighten this up. It's not, a, it's not a very happy story. And there are many other consequences that I could actually have mentioned, but I decided to settle for those three main consequences. So I'll finish by having a shot at the solution. And it's not easy. There's no easy solution to this. The proposal, the policy that I would suggest is the following. And I think it applies across the board as a possible United States policy towards the issue of the control of weapons of mass destruction. It is that when there is a new administration in the United States, a matter of first priority in foreign policy has to be to make plain to the Russians that the Cold War is over, really over, and that old-fashioned client state type patronage by them of criminals like Saddam Hussein is not acceptable behavior from a permanent member of the Security Council and that it will be a matter of supreme importance to the United States that consensus be rejoined between Russia and the United States and the United Kingdom, France and China would inevitably follow. That's not to ignore their concerns, they would need to be addressed too. But the core of it is our management of the post-Cold War period and the need for the United States to make clear as a matter of truly important policy that it is not prepared to accept the sort of behavior that we've seen from Russia in patronizing Saddam Hussein when what is at stake is the things that I mentioned the security of the non-proliferation regimes, the, st the stability of the Middle East, it is not, and, and the reputation and authority of the Security Council, that those are issues that should not be the subject of narrowly defined national interest, but should always be the subject of assured collective action by the great powers who have been given great authority in the Security Council and particular responsibility for the maintenance of peace and security. If that were to occur, if consensus in holding Saddam to account were to be able to be forged again, I'm not sure that military action would be required. 
I think it's as clear as can be that the, the chief beneficiary today of division amongst the great powers is the rogue. And take that away and his situation would be very, very different. And I think that is the first and most important thing that needs to be done. There is no doubt that it would bring a price. It's in the nature of things that the Russians would want concessions elsewhere. It could bring a price in terms of bringing other states on board, in particular Arab states <coughs> and other non-aligned countries. It could bring a price in terms of demands being placed on the United States and Russia to get back on the track of reducing further their own weapons, in particular nuclear weapons, because the iniquity of the, the situation uh, that exists with respect to possession or not of weapons of mass destruction is well known in the world. And it's one of the things that a Saddam Hussein calls attention to. You are seeking to strip us of our arms, but you yourself continue to maintain large quantities of them. There could be prices of that kind that need to be paid. But I just ask as a question, would that be such a high price to pay to resume further reductions, negotiated, verifiable reductions in big weapons between the US and Russia? If part of the overall understanding was that this would enable us together to deal with a rogue state, instead of, instead of being naked and alone and having to think of fanciful ideas like national missile defence to deal with a rogue state who doesn't even have the weapons that such a system is supposed to deal with. Wouldn't it be better to try to get the big picture back on track and try to deal with those two, those two birds with the one stone? The, the, the solution, I suggest, lies in that direction. It is to start anew with Russia and remind them that yes, the Cold War is over and behaviours of the kind that we see with them with respect to Saddam are not acceptable and that above all, to finish on a positive note, that the Cold War is over actually provides us with opportunities. Opportunities to make this world safer by together shoring up the non-proliferation regimes, by keeping the promise of reducing the danger by ourselves reducing the quantity of weapons that are still hanging over from the Cold War period and are vastly in excess of what we need for our security. And the opportunity to deal together with what surely is, forgive me if I use the title of my book, the greatest threat, which is the threat that we face from rogue states. Thank you very much. general asked me to keep good my, my volunteering to tell you about the French. Actually, General, what I said is, no, no I said, actually, you're right, I said you might want to ask about that, right? Yeah. Well, I guess I asked for that. What I had said earlier, I had, in a slight slip of the tongue, had at least at least implied that the French aren't part of the West. Remember? And I said, well, I don't know where they are, but let's maybe talk about that later. It, it was fascinating for me in the Security Council to watch the behaviour of the French. 
the French have, they think, a long-established relationship with the Arab world. They have very significant economic interests there, in particular in oil. And that has motivated them to look for it sounds, I'm hesitating because I find it almost despicable to say, but a more constructive relationship with Saddam Hussein because they see that it might satisfy some of their national interests, in particular oil, where Total and Ajip have investments in Iraqi oil fields. But there's something more important than that that I'm sure others with me in the Security Council would agree. Uh, was perceptible, able to be discerned. As the United States got into more and more difficulty in its dealings with Iraq in the period of 87, uh, 97, 98, 99, the French took a kind of pleasure in observing this difficulty take place because, you see, it accorded with their view that a unipolar world a world of one superpower is not in French interest. Their preference is for a multipolar world. Prime Minister Lionel Jospin has written a book recently talking about the problems of a hyperpower, not a superpower, a hyperpower. And you can read daily in French newspapers and magazines uh, really quite unworthy things about the problems in this world that are authored by the overbearing power of the United States. And it was very clear to see within the Security Council that even more important than their economic and other interests in the Arab world was this idea of pleasure at some chinks in the armour of a unipolar world. Now I'm going to say something that you might think is absurd, but it's not. I'm speaking the truth. Finally, it's, it is deeply disturbing to the French that that unipolar world is increasingly an anglophonic world. <laughs> and they have a real problem with that. So uh, that has motivated the French on the Iraq issue to draw a distinction between themselves and the United States and the United Kingdom and to hedge their bets at all stages to the point where in the last major resolution of the Council on Iraq, the one that set up the successor organisation to UNSCOM, the French delayed the vote on that resolution for three days saying they weren't ready to vote. But what they were doing was trying to persuade Russia to come on board the western side so that they could be on the western side because Russia had indicated that it was not going to support this resolution and France had one of these exquisite designed in Paris tests that they faced was to be with the west or to be with Russia on this Middle Eastern issue and it was proving to be agony for them and so they tried to put off the debate for several days uh, the vote for several days. They succeeded in postponing it and then in the end it shut down in a matter of minutes when Russia informed France, we've heard your arguments, the answer is no, we're going, we going to abstain on this resolution, we're not going to be on the western side and France joined Russia. So when faced with the choice it did not vote with the west and you could say, ask well what how is that possible? And I'll tell you how it's possible. It's possible because it's our fault. It's because we always say, when things like this happen, I've heard it more times than I've had hot dinners, we always say, when something awful like that happens, we say, well, it's the French. What else do you expect? <laughs> we somehow allow for a degree of French idiosyncrasy and so on that allows them to escape. And they know that we will do that. They know that we will be awfully dark on them for 24 hours, but in the end they'll still be a part of the Western Alliance or Western Community of States, which of course they are. And 
That's the French motivation here. They do not like a unipolar world, and especially when it's anglophonic. And they want to see established a multipolar system. And they're using the Iraq case, a case the main hallmark of which is American pain, frankly, uh, as an opportunity for them to promote that cause. Now, to lighten up these funereal proceedings, <laughs> let me tell you a true French story. <laughs> One day I took into the Security Council in 1998 some U2 pictures. Again, this is how hard I was trying to crack the nut and get the Iraq problem solved. Risks were involved in showing the council these pictures. I had to get certain clearances for them and so on. But I wanted to show them a picture to prove the kind of uh, deception that Iraq was entering, in, entering into. I, so I showed them a before and after picture. The before picture was of a facility, a major military facility, where we knew there were weapons-related materials stored, to which our trucks were approaching. Picture number one. Our trucks were blocked and we didn't get in and we, didn't, we were delayed for three hours before we could get in and we saw signs of movement of trucks going out the back door, Iraqi trucks going out the back gate. So picture number two that our bird very, ha very conveniently got for us from the sky. Thank you very much to the United States Air Force. Picture number two was of a gathering out in the desert some 60 or 70 miles away of, are you ready for this? You're all sitting down. 90 trucks. Nine zero. Some of them in Republican Guard colours that it were the trucks that had driven away from this facility with whatever materials they were keeping from us and all gone out and met at Wadi El somewhere or other in the <laughs> desert. And there was picture number two. You have to think about this, you know? This was like nowhere. I'm going to get every drop out of this that I can. <laughs> this, this, this was just nowhere. There was nothing. There was just this empty Iraqi desert with 90 trucks looking at each other, parked like this. You know. Okay, And I said to the Security Council, that's before, this is after. That's, impeden that, that's impedance to our work. That's avoidance of inspection. Those trucks presumably took away the very materials that we we're going to see. You know, I was trying to make the picture as childlike or as clear as I could. The French ambassador. Now, I'm telling you the truth. I am not making this up, okay? The French ambassador, consistent with their policy of trying to knock down everything we were doing and ridicule us in the United States and so on, this spy plane, you know, blah, 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 which was a completely legitimate tool that we were using for appropriate purposes, right? The French ambassador said, oh, Mr. President, you know, the President of Security Council, Mr. President, he said, I see what these pictures mean, he said, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I am not sure, I mean, before and after, perhaps, uh, what could you say? Perhaps it was a trucker's picnic. <laughs> I didn't make that up. That is true. You know something? That harmed us. Because exactly what happened in this room happened there. People in the Security Council laughed was a wonderful example of the power of ridicule. People laughed, and I believe to this day, by that means, Monsieur Alain Desjemais, His Excellency the Ambassador of France, put one slug into us. He threw a little doubt on our pictures. Really. Mr. Ambassador, Tom Adams, your combat command, with uh, your experience uh, in Iraq, uh, I know our allies, the French, and uh, most of the uh, Arab countries have been flying into Iraq in uh, regard to the uh, sanctions. Where do you see our ability to enforce the northern and southern no-fly zones now with the commercial airliners 
coming into the country? Well, I mean, that's partly a technical question that there are at least 100 people in this room more competent to answer than I, I think. Uh, I don't know how, you know, how busy are the airlines going to be? I mean, you can discern between civilian and military aircraft. It's just going to get more crowded, right? That's right. The, the sanctions don't, uh, don't are, are military fixed wing there are other sanctions that, yeah. that prohibit countries going back and forth, but we're not going to interfere yeah. with that. I mean, the, 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 on the technical level, I guess the airways get a bit more crowded, uh, and maybe that just complicates doing the job. But I don't think that's, I, I would assume, and Colonel, you, I, you won't disagree, I suspect that that's not a problem. A higher degree of complication, that's all. What's the real problem is the political one is the political opposition that will continue to grow to the maintenance of no-fly zones as such. And uh, I'm not sure how long the United States can hang out and defend those politically. I go back to my prescription, which is ambitious and tough, right? But this is a you know, of talking first to the Russians and trying to restore consensus on doing the right thing in this world is what, to put it in simplest, is what I'm saying. These are one of the things, this may be one of the things that would need to be given up. The Russians will say these no-fly zones are illegal, they're not formally approved under sanctions, you know, the stuff that they said, and we don't like them, get rid of them. Okay, maybe that's one of the things that is given up in return for Russian return to consensus on the real job at hand. You know, it's, it's, it's bad politics to get beaten around the ears for something that actually doesn't achieve your objective. Sanctions too aren't achieving the arms control objective. Sanctions have had it as far as the arms control objective is concerned. Remember, they were to remain as long as he was not disarmed. He's still not disarmed and they're physically crumbling before our eyes. I'm, I'm evidence of what I'm saying. Uh, I'm standing here, I'm not there. It's two years since I or the man who succeeded me has been there. There are no inspections. So, you know, sanctions aren't doing the job that they were supposed to do, which is to encourage this dictator to be disarmed. So there are lots of things that need to be revisited. The role of sanctions. What we need is targeted sanctions to target the bank accounts of the leadership, not the food supplies of ordinary people, for example. You know, we, no fly zones may have played a useful role for a while, but now they're becoming a political liability. What we've got to do is find the things that home in on the things that really do count and up the ante with others on those things. So these, these are our red lines. That guy gets disarmed. That guy is stopped from tearing up the arms control regimes. And we want you, Russia and others, to stand with us and do that. If you've got a few things you want us to pay in return, like stop the no-fly zones, fine. But as long as we're going to do the real job. You see what I mean? Uh, and I think, they're the, I think the politics of the no-fly zones are what is more important than the technicalities of it. Sir Dave Franz, uh, what are the lessons learned from UNSCOM that can help us with the legally binding protocol to the BWC or other implications for that protocol? Um, <clears throat> the protocol for BWC is first of all uh, perhaps one of the most difficult instruments that contemporary arms control negotiations have seen because of the ubiquitous nature of the technologies involved and their inherent dual use aspect. And I suppose to the small scale on which biology can be done as against say the relatively large scale plant that's involved in making a nuclear explosive device. I think verification of nuclear undertakings is a piece of cake in comparison with what is required in the biology field. So it's a very difficult field. Uh, secondly, I believe it can be negotiated if people are prepared to take seriously enough the intrinsic threat of biological weapons. And I think that I think the deficiency 
so far in the negotiation lies in that field. People, people have not concentrated their minds seriously enough on how important it is and how urgent it is to get it done. Again, I would hope that a new leadership in the United States might ratchet that one up a bit. I gave a talk last night at the Johns Hopkins seminar, or well, it was a very large meeting of about a thousand people, on bioterrorism and put forward in Washington, put forward there the idea for consideration that biological weapons, the possession of them, might be moved into the category of constituting a prima facie crime against humanity because of their intrinsic nature. And were that to happen, that would trigger a series of events and possibilities in terms of uh, law enforcement and apprehension of people in possession of these things that would be, I think, appropriate for biology. Uh, but, um, you know, and, but no, but doesn't exist in any way at all today. But to get back to the point, for, but a first step towards any, whether or not such a thing would happen will be now a subject of debate, I suppose. But before getting to that point, um, a reliable means of verification is required. I believe it can be done, it can be negotiated. I don't think the will to get it done has been available. I think if that will is there, then it can be done. I have a bit of difficulty with your notion of legally binding. Uh, can I ask you what you mean by that? You mean inevitably enforceable? Yeah, I, I understood legally binding is the term that's used for the yeah. protocol that's being negotiated. Well, I mean, the, the, um, I'm the, just parroting the, what... Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, well, it's not... I mean, the answer is yes, it can be. It, I mean, the all, all states party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty are legally bound to enter into a safeguards agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency and therefore legally bound to receive inspections. Under the Chemical Weapons Convention, you are legally bound to receive inspections. I don't see why that can't be the case with respect to the BWC. The point of distinction I'm making is that binding people legally, while appropriate, and indeed in the biological case, I've just exposed to you part of my current thinking is that I think biology is so serious and the weapons are so useless other than for deeply inhumane purposes that they really ought, the mere possession of them really ought to be made a criminal act, is what I'm saying. But the point about making any of these things legally binding is that that is desultory and potentially meaningless unless you have a justice system to run those people to ground. That means a proper reporting system. And I get back to my point, then a reliable means of enforcing what you then find. And I think that's more important in a way. I mean, that's the underpinning of any legally binding system being reliable is if people people get it in their heads that if they rob that bank and they're you know I mean it's to use domestic law as an analogy if you rob that bank and get caught you will be sent to jail it doesn't mean that people stop robbing all people stop robbing banks because as someone once said why rob banks it's because that's where the money is you know and there, some people will do that but there must be a very large number of people who consider robbing a bank because that's where the money is uh, but pause and don't do it because they know that if they are caught they will go to jail for a very long time and that's what we don't have in the arms control area. Mr. Ambassador, I think it's um, we, have to, we have to make sure that we leave time for uh, your media. Uh, let me say on behalf of uh, the Counter Proliferation Center very gripping, very powerful, very uh, informative, a very profound speech. Uh, let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, not only this group, but I think um, America and certainly the world owes you a debt of gratitude. This is a very small token of our appreciation, but I'd like to ask General Lord to come forward now and, uh, and make a presentation.
Sir, on behalf of General McGee and Dr. Snyder and the whole team assembled here today, I want to thank you, too, for uh, probably one of the most stimulating uh, evenings we've had in a long, long time here, sir. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your dedicated yeah. service. And uh, as a rugby guy, I know you've been close to the earth on occasion, so uh, what we want to do is give you a little uh, Alabama clay that's fashioned in the eagle, and I know that you've, uh, you've stood tall for uh, your nation and all of us, and we want to thank you for that. And uh, what we say here is this is our second annual uh, United States Air Force Counterproliferation Conference. Uh, we cannot afford to be the unready confronting the unthinkable. In your, uh, your book, uh, you know, the, the, the real threat we've got to uh, work together on. So thank you, sir, for all thank this. You Please accept much. this on our behalf. And, uh, we'll be thank you very much, General. This is really extraordinary. And it does say they're Alabama clay. So, let's soar like an eagle, huh? Roger that. Thank you, Okay, sir. thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the formal portion of the evening. Uh, thank you very much, and drive home safely.